Welcome to Shattering Myths, a program devoted to the fastest growing segment of our society. To those of you who, like me, know that there is something troubling, even destructive, about religion and politics, media reporting, military invasions, and economic schemes. We realize that these institutions are part of the problem. They're not the solution. So instead of merely presenting the news, our mission will be to understand what is causing the tragedies that are besieging our planet, while predicting how these events will influence our world if we don't stand up to them. And that is why in our second hour we're going to engage God on His terms, through evidence and reason, since His guidance regarding His covenant provides hope, the only reliable response to an exceedingly troubled world. Words, wisely wielded, provide the answer for everything that ails us, from economic ruin to terrorism, from religious myths to political hypocrisy. Our phone number over the next two hours, if you'd like to participate in this discussion, is 877-300-7645. In a moment, we're going to return to the testimony of the congressman who introduced the Patriot Act, talking about its uh, failings. But before we do, the news was so bleak out of Egypt yesterday. We will visit that country first. Egyptian security forces have stormed two protest camps, occupied by supporters of deposed President Mohamed Morsi in Cairo, with reports of many, many people killed. Witnesses said they saw at least 40 bodies, but the Muslim Brotherhead says that hundreds died. Now, of course, it's interesting that what we called the Arab Spring, which was a misnomer, it was an Islamic reformation that swept through northern Africa, largely prompted by President Barack Hussein Obama, who spoke of the landscaping changing events of Islam and how it was such a great religion that it made such a contribution to the world. He gave them permission, if you will, to rise up, and they did. And Tunisia went from a secular country to an Islamic country. Libya went from a secular dictatorship to a dictatorship now of jihadists. Egypt voted almost 70% for the most fundamentalist Muslims. Not just for the Muslim Brotherhood, but the Salafists who are even more fundamentalist than the Muslim Brotherhood. And then in a military coup, because over a few days there were many protesters of that government, recognizing that in Egypt, if 65 to 70 percent of the population are, as they voted, Islamic, Islamic fundamentalists, then what we know is that 10 percent of that population is Coptic Christians. They would be opposed to the Muslim Brotherhood because the imposition of fundamentalist Islam in that country, taking that country away from a secular dictator, means they're as good as dead. And they know it. Life was hard enough for them living in an Islamic country where Muslims treat Christians as if they are a lower form of life than a domesticated animal. When Muslims have no respect for their own lives, you know that their lack of respect for the lives of others is a serious problem. So the 10% of Egyptians who still live that are Copt Christians represent about 8 million uh, people. And then you have the secular influence in Egypt, approximately 20% of the country is leans towards secularism. That would mean that in a country like Egypt where 90% of the population is Islamic, that would mean that these are bad Muslims. Now being a bad Muslim opens the opportunity for them to be good people. There are many bad Muslims who are good people, live peacefully with their neighbors, willing to embrace the kinds of values that are articulated in the Torah that enable us to thrive. 
But if they become a good Muslim, then they become terrorists. There is no such thing as a good Muslim who is not a terrorist. All good Muslims are terrorists. I don't say that to be slanderous. I don't say that to be hurtful. I don't say that because I want to engage in hate speech. I say that because it's the truth. All one has to do is read the Quran's definition of a good and bad Muslim. And the Quran states unequivocally in the ninth surah, which is the second to last revealed, emphasizing everything Muhammad and Allah have said up to that point, that you become a hypocrite as a Muslim, and therefore a very, very bad Muslim, when you are peaceful. That all good Muslims are jihadists, according to the ninth surah. And the ninth surah goes on to say that the solution, as does much of the Medinan surahs, that the solution and the way you deal that Allah wants good Muslims to deal with peaceful, hypocritical Muslims is to kill them, to terrorize them. And that's what they're doing around the world. So that being the case, that's by definition the case. It's not my opinion. It's not a pejorative statement. It's just a statement of fact that according to the Quran, which is along with the Hadith from Muhammad, the lone source of definitions as to what it is to be a good and bad Muslim, and what Allah's and Muhammad's statements are regarding them, to be a good Muslim is to be a jihadist, to be a killer. To be a bad Muslim is to be peaceful and therefore to be a hypocrite. So in Egypt, there are about 20% of the Egyptians that are hypocrites as Muslims. And they are good people. Collectively, they represent, between them and the Christians, about 30% of the Egyptian population. They did rise up in unison. And that's a lot of people. You've got an 80 million population country where a significant portion of 30% of the population rose up against the Muslim Brotherhood and the realization that the reporting from Egypt had all been falsified in the American media and by American politicians, that Mercy had taken what was a secular country and made it a fundamentalist Islamic theocracy based on Sharia law. And they rose up against that. And it is interesting that the military that Morsi had sequestered under his control sided with those 30% of the people, not with the 70% that voted for the Muslim Brotherhood and the Salafist Muslims. Even though the new head of the Egyptian army was a fundamentalist Muslim himself. And we applauded it, saying, oh, that's an extension of democracy because millions of people stood up to the Muslim Brotherhood, which was taking the country to a, back to theocracy, to Sharia. But they represented 30% of the people. We uh, want them to vote again, but if they vote again, 70% of the people are going to vote for the most fundamentalist Muslims. There is no way for 30% of the people who are the decent people in that country to successfully elect a leader. This mess is unresolvable. There is no solution. Egypt will either live under the tyranny of a military dictatorship as it has for so many years, or it will become an Islamic theocracy. Both are bad. The former is better than the latter. We ought not, as a nation, side with any form of evil. An Islamic military dictatorship is a bad option. But the alternative is far worse. It's, it's like what we didn't figure out in Iraq when we invaded. Saddam Hussein was a bad guy. Dictatorships are bad things. But if you give the Muslims living in these countries, they vote, they will vote as their imam tells them to because their imam will tell them that if they don't vote this way, Allah will burn their britches in hell. And so they vote for the most fundamentalist Islamic candidates. 
And that's what we did in Iraq. We simply took Iraq away from a secular dictator and gave it to the Shiite clerics in Tehran. It was suicidal what we did. Egypt, the same alternative exists. That's just the reality. We can't fix it. So long as Islam is the driving force in these countries, their problems cannot be resolved. The same situation exists in Syria, where you have two evil forces opposing one another. Assad is one of the most ruthless dictators in the world. Those who impose him are far more ruthless than he is. We ought not be there. Now, returning to Egypt, armored bulldozers moved deep into the main camp of Morsi supporters. Now, why would you send in bulldozers if it was not not only to destroy the 10th camp setups of those who had come to protest, but also to bury the bodies? Officials say that another protest camp in Nakhda Square was also cleared, and not with tear gas, cleared with bulldozers. Graphic accounts of bloodshed emerged from the protest camps as reporters described wounded protesters being treated next to the dead in makeshift hospitals. The 17-year-old's daughter of a leading Muslim Brotherhood figure, Mohammed Belt Agay, was among the dead. Asma Elt Batigay was shot in the back and in the chest, her brother said. A cameraman working for Sky News, Mark Dean, has also been killed in the violence. There were reports throughout Egypt of unrest. At least five people had been killed in the province of Suez, according to the health ministry. Witnesses, Morsi supporters attempted to storm government buildings there. Clashes have also been reported in the northern provinces of Alexandria. And the reason that they occur there, if you recall, there the Muslim Brotherhood did not carry the vote. In those communities, it was the Salafist party, far more fundamentalist even than the Muslim Brotherhood, that reigned supreme. Hundreds are said to have gathered outside the governor's office in Aswan in the south. Morsi supporters blockaded roads in Alexandria. And of course, these fundamentalist Muslims have attacked and burned three churches throughout Egypt. Back to Shattering Miss, I'm your host, Yada. It is still unclear, the authorities say in Egypt, how many casualties were caught up in the two uh, Cairo operations by the military. Figures differ widely and have been impossible to verify independently because if you are a member of the Western media, you're as good as dead. One man has died, and who knows how many others will have uh, perished with him. Western journalists uh, have said that, that as they walked through the remains of these protest camps, that they saw scores of bodies in makeshift morgues. One of the websites of the Muslim Brotherhood, which supports the protests, said that the military killed more than 800 Muslims. The health ministry says the official death toll is 56, but that's of just people who made it to the hospital morgues. Boy, we have a mess. And again, the thing that I want to emphasize here is that there is no resolution to this mess. There's no resolution to the mess in Iraq that is now erupted back into a civil war. There's no resolution to the mess in Afghanistan, which will be worse than we find, found it once we leave. And it's worse than we in, it was when we invaded even now. There is no resolution for what happened in Tunisia, what happened in Libya, where we were a contributing factor. These problems cannot be resolved. In Syria, there is no hope for victory. There is no good side. There isn't even a side representing evil that you could embrace without it being suicidal. We just need to back away. 
The smartest thing that, that the United States can do in the Islamic world is twofold, neither of one which we're capable of doing. The first of those is to realize that there's only one uh, oasis of civility throughout the entire Islamic world. And that's that little island of two-tenths of one percent of the region called Yisrael. We ought to be resolutely supportive of Yisrael, or at least, if not that, leave them alone. We ought not be doing the Neville Chamberlain mistake all over again and compelling Yisrael to give up its high ground, just as Neville Chamberlain forced Czechoslovakia, Czechoslovakia to give the high ground of their country up to the Nazis. It became the catalyst of the last world war. If America succeeds in forcing the capitulation in Yisrael, Europe also sponsoring the same thing, all of the Muslims demanding the same thing, then the world will be engaged in world war. But this time, the death toll will not be 55 million, not even close. This time, the death toll will be in the billions, because that world war will erupt into a nuclear exchange. That's our future. We cannot stop that future, but as Americans, we can at least stand up and tell our government to stop trying to compel Israel to give a mythical people a mythical land. There is no such thing as a Palestinian people. There is no such thing as a country called Palestine. There never has been, there never will be. We ought to stop rewarding terrorists. The PLO is still the driving force amongst the Arab Muslims in the West Bank and Gaza. The only rival to the PLO is Hamas. They are fundamentalist Islamic terrorist organizations. We ought not reward them with our money, with our weapons, or by strong-arming Israel, forcing them to capitulate to these terrorists. That's the first thing we ought to do. The second thing is, even though America seems only able to export destruction, we ought to cease selling weapons and giving weapons away to Islamic countries. We ought not provide billions of dollars worth of weapons free to Pakistan or to Egypt. And we ought not sell weapons to Saudi Arabia, to Kuwait, to Qatar, to any of these countries. Because those weapons will be fired at Israel. And when they are, we will anger the creator of the universe causing the creator of the universe to despise the nation that provided the instruments that harmed his children. It is something to think about. We'll return to Shattering This after the commercial break. Welcome back to Shattering This. I'm your host, Yada. Yesterday, uh, we were talking about uh, how uh, Sensenbrenner, the uh, former chairman of the House Science and uh, House Judiciary Committee, has uh, made headlines uh, recently when he said that the National Security Agency's power to collect phone records and emails on all Americans has gone too far and that, they, that America has gone way beyond the Patriot Act boundaries. The fact is the Patriot Act should never have been foisted on America. What we did is we responded to the Islamic terrorist attacks of 9-11 by mislabeling the enemy uh, and then by imposing terror on the American people. Yes, we punished the American people for the acts of Islam and did not hold Islam accountable. That's what our government did. That's why my encouragement to all who know that there's something troubling about both political parties who have stopped voting, it's most of you, who 
know there's something really wrong with your religion and have stopped going, stop endorsing them and paying them. That we just stop being patriotic. You know, I have a nostalgia for uh, a ideal America that I, uh, I long for, but it's not realistic. It's not the America that exists anymore. There's no hope institutionally for our country. We aren't going to solve this problem by voting good people into office because there's no good people to vote for. We aren't going to solve this problem by supporting our military as if more guns and bullets and bombs was going to make a difference. It's making a difference, all right, but it's making it worse. We aren't going to solve this problem by providing most, more Social Security, more Medicare, more Medicaid, it's making the situation worse. We aren't going to solve this problem through tax reform. Economically, we have already bankrupt ourselves. We're just playing with smoke and mirrors now. The problem can't be solved politically, can't be solved religiously. The media is way too far gone to expect them to do the right thing for the right reason. So we need to turn to the place where there is individual hope, and that's in our relationship with God. We can make a difference. We can be better than we are individually. We can come to know God as he actually is, not as man has tried to conceive him. That's the nature of religions. It's different than the actual relationship that God intended and the actual relationship God made us. In religions, man makes God. We can resolve this, and we'll turn in the second hour to a discussion as to how we go about doing that. But continuing with this admission by uh, Sensenbrenner that the National Security Agency's power to collect phone records and emails on all Americans has gone way beyond what is could ever be considered reasonable. We find that he told uh, a television host that the secret court that grants the National Security Agency those powers must be reined in. We must try to force the FISA, the Foreign Intelligence Security Court, to follow the law. No, we need to change the law so that the law is in harmony with the U.S. Constitution. We need to go back to that document, which means you can't do this. That document says there shall be no unreasonable search and seizure. The NSA has to be shut down. That's the only answer. If we're going to be a virtuous people, if we're going to adhere to what is a reasonable standard, a moral standard, that there shall be no unreasonable search and seizure, that there ought to be free expression and free speech, we have to shut the NSA down, eliminate it. We would be wise also to shut the CIA down. You know, if we were just reasonable, rational, moral people in our dealings with the rest of the world, if we just stopped killing people with our drones, if we stopped being the most militaristic nation on earth and exporting our means to kill and destroy, we wouldn't have people trying to kill us. It's just time we rein them in. We must try to force the FISA court to follow the law, he said. Its orders requiring the phone companies and Internet companies to go far beyond what the Patriot Act required was simply a rubber stamping. That's the, again, the courts never turned down anything. The, the, uh, the opposing side is never presented. The president's now said, you know, maybe in a secret court we ought to present the opposing side. What use would that be? They just appoint a different judge if he ever accepted the opposition's view. The power is too much. It's absolute. The federal courts are supposed to protect our constitutional rights, and I guess they do a better job of that when they don't meet in secret. Federal courts don't protect our rights. They have been usurping our rights for years. The system is gamed. It's no longer just, maybe hasn't been just in a very long time.
He acknowledged that there was divided opinion on whether the surveillance of America has gone too far. And the reason for that is the same reason that Bill Clinton wasn't impeached. Right before the impeachment hearings, Hillary confiscated the FBI files on congressmen and senators, particularly their moral behavior. All she had to do was call those in the judiciary and say, you know, if you want to impeach my husband, what do you think the media would do with this file if I released it about your behavior? Well, the NSA protects its turf the same way the CIA protected its turf, the same way the FBI has protected its turf. It keeps files on those who are supposed to rein it in. And if anyone wants to speak out against it, they're exposed. Their reputations are destroyed. So it's obvious that they have gone too far, and yet there are those on both sides of the aisles that say, no, no, this is all fair. You want to have your, your family protected from terrorism, which, by the way, can, is a myth then you need this. And yet what we find, and even uh, this congressman affirmed, is that the source of 99% of terrorism is excluded from the NSA surveillance, which is Islamic mosques. More Republicans are telling me, you know, that thank you for standing up on this. They are telling uh, Sensenbrenner, but the fact of the matter is they themselves won't stand up. He says, I consider myself a terrorist hawk. That is to say, I am a moron. That a hawk is someone, you know, that would, would uh, be aggressive and, uh, and uh, would support, for example, a, a hawk militaristically wants America to have a bigger military than the rest of the world combined. And they think that somehow that makes America safe when we have the biggest military in the world and larger than every other nation combined. And so he's a terrorist hawk, but terrorism is a tactic. The nation that is killing the most people via terrorist acts right now is the United States. We do so when we, we did so when we invaded Iraq, when we invaded Afghanistan, and we use our drones. We didn't fight the militaries there. We fought and killed civilians. That is the reality of this whole thing. We're fighting and killing civilians. So how can you be a terrorist hawk and be a patriot, be a congressman? It's impossible. Because if you're a, against terrorism, then you'll be against America. That's just the reality of our current situation. He says, but I also consider myself one whose obligation is to balance civil liberties and constitutional protections that have made America different with the need for security. Oh, so I'm only willing to infringe the Constitution modestly to protect uh, America. So if the option is security or constitutional rights, uh, I'm going to make a compromise as opposed to be wholly in favor of violating the U.S. Constitution. He said a police state is completely secure. We never want that to happen here, but that's what we have become. When you look at what happened in Boston after the two boys detonated um, pressure cooker bombs, two boys, two just kids, detonated pressure cooker bombs, we turned Boston into a police state. Did you ever watch the, the film that came out of there and the hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of vehicles, unmarked vehicles, the FBI, CIA, Homeland Security, you know, the, it, it, it's an alphabet soup of agencies. So many different policing agencies and paramilitary agencies and National Guard agencies and, and actual military units that descended on that community. We turned into a police state. And if we can do it there to react to two boys with pressure cookers, we can do it everywhere. That's what we have become. We're also a prison state. We imprison more of our own population than any country on earth. It's not even close. And now we have a gamed judicial system. 
We have a country that is spying on its own people. And for good reason. When you act this badly, your own people are likely to distrust you. Sensenbrenner, congressman, said that he hopes that the United States will be able to apprehend Edward Snowden. You know, but in his next interview on uh, Laura Ingram, this was a television interview, that was a radio interview, he says, you know, if it hadn't been for Edward Snowden, we wouldn't know about this secret court. We wouldn't know about the NSA's infringement into our rights. But yet now he wants him apprehended. I mean, there's only one noble character in this whole mess. It's Edward Snowden. Everybody else is violating their sworn oaths to protect the Constitution. Everyone else is pretending that spying on ordinary Americans is keeping them safe. No, it's keeping the government safe from ordinary Americans, and that's all it does. They're upset with Snowden because he embarrassed the government. They ought to have been embarrassed. He uh, goes on to say that getting a treason rap against him is going to be tough. Yeah, because if you say that he aided the enemy, then what you have to say is the American people are the enemy. That's who the NSA is spying on. How do you get a treason rap for somebody who says that the government has turned their own people into the enemy without further embarrassing oneself? We'll return with the rest of this story and others when Shattering Myths continues after the commercial break. Welcome back to Shattering Myths. I'm your host, uh, Yetta, as we uh, look at uh, this, the reporting regarding uh, Islamic places of worship being excluded from NSA surveillance. And thus, the source for 99% of terrorism no longer being targeted. The Washington Times uh, decided that they would carry the story that I have shared with you from Investors Business Daily. And they, uh, they reported that, um, uh, that its remarks were scathing for the Obama administration. After claiming that despite the NSA sweeping PRISM program, mosques have been off limits by FBI surveillance since October 2011. That's right, the government sweeping surveillance of our most private communications excludes the jihad factories where terrorists are radicalized, the editorial reads. Well, the fact is they're not radicalized. Fundamentalist Muslims are encouraged to to follow Muhammad's example. Muhammad was a terrorist. We need to go beyond this myth that Islam is a peaceful religion and only extreme Muslims are terrorists. That's just not the case. High level approval from a special oversight body at the Justice Department of the Sensitive Operations Review Committee is needed in order to survey a mosque and the names of the, the individuals who comprise uh, this committee, its chairman and its members, as well as its staff, are kept secret, just as is the case with the secret court. We do not know the panel, or I said we do know that the panel was set up under pressure from Islamist groups that complained about FBI stings at mosques. In February of 2011, the Council on American Islamic Relations and the ACLU sued the FBI for violating the civil rights of Muslims by hiring undercover agents to pose as worshipers to monitor mosques. That was the impetus for this. Before mosques were excluded from otherwise domestic spy nets the administration has cast, the FBI launched dozens of sting operations against homegrown jihadists inside mosques and disrupted dozens of plots inside uh, the country. If only they were allowed to continue, perhaps many other victims, of, or most of the victims, if not all of the victims of the marathon uh, bombing, would not have lost lives and limbs. The FBI never 
canvassed the Boston mosques until days after the April 15th attacks. And it did not check out the, as they call it, radical Boston mosque where the Muslim brothers worshipped. One of the Muslim bombers made extremist outbursts during worship, but uh, that mosque wasn't monitored. Red flags didn't go off inside the FBI about this increasing radicalization before the attacks. Even when a reporter gets it, even when a reporter says, we have a problem, they don't get it. It's just like the Republicans trying to hold Barack Obama accountable for lying about the cause of the Benghazi attacks, and the best they can do is to say it was a terrorist attack, it wasn't a spontaneous reaction to a movie. They can't go the next step, which you need to go if you have any hope of resolution. Resolution to our problems only comes when we wield words wisely, when we actually investigate the truth, when we're not afraid to make conclusions, when we're not afraid of exercising good judgment. If we continue to deceive ourselves, this idea that radicalization is the problem in Islam, if we continue to deceive ourselves and think of jihadists as a fringe of Muslims, then we have no hope of resolving the problem. We need more Americans to study the Quran and Hadith. Read it. Put it in chronological order. Set it in the context of Muhammad's life. Compare the Hadith and the Quran so that you know what Muhammad did, what he said. Come to understand what it would require for a Muslim to do as Allah orders in the Quran to follow his and his messenger's orders. That would be Muhammad's orders, which are only presented in the Hadith, and to follow Muhammad's example. Come to understand that the Hadith and Quran present Muhammad as a terrorist, as a ruthless murderer, as a pedophile, as incestuous, as a rapist, as a slave trader, as a kidnapper, as an avowed liar. Come to understand who Muhammad was, what, Muhammad, what Muslims are asked to follow, so that you understand that the terrorists have not corrupted their religion, their religion has corrupted them.